I'd like to offer a prayer, if I may, a prayer of John Wesley. We bless you for bringing us safe to the beginning of a new day. Grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger. Keep us, we pray, from all things hurtful to body or soul, and grant us your pardon and peace, so that being cleansed from all our sins, we might serve you with quiet hearts and minds and continue in the same until our life's end, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. Now, Lord, we offer prayers for the friendless and the lonely and those outside of the church family. We pray for those who suffer physically. We pray for those who are in danger, those who are in distress, and there are many as they struggle with, um, well, such things as the hurricanes and the response to the result of that. May this time of worship strengthen our resolve to live lives of generosity and love that is unconditional, the love from you, Lord, that we pass on. May this time of fellowship give us the courage to be Christ to a hurting community, to a hurting world. In the words of the psalmist, teach us to follow your decrees, give to us understanding, direct our feet, turn our eyes away from worthless things and our hearts to obedience. Again, I would ask that you would minister to the uh, hurricane victims as well as many who are innocent victims of war and, and poverty and, and so many things. I offer prayer for those uh, that are present and the needs of those on the prayer list and the hope chest. Bless the church around the world. Bless our nation. Thank you for amazing grace. In Christ's name, amen. The song I'm going to share with you this morning is... Uh, Hopefully, the okay um, is uses your favorite word, I believe. What's pastor's it, it favorite is. word? It's grace, and this is all because of grace. I can tell you, both of the first and the second verse were written on real life stories, but the first verse is uh, particularly uh, noteworthy to me because it uh, was it dealt with my cousin. Uh, you know, I think every house or every family has a, a black sheep along the way, and I guess he would be considered that. He's my first cousin. And he had grown up in the church. He'd grown up a follower of Christ and sort of strayed and uh, went all different directions. He ended up in jail for a good while. And uh, his sisters uh, just sort of denounced him. And one was older, one was younger. And that went on for a long period of time. And he got out of jail and, and he went back to the church and he recommitted himself. And through God's grace, he was saved. Um, but yet there was... There was uh, resistance on his sister's part to take him back in. And uh, as, as it would happen, uh, when Juanita passed away, obviously we invited both the sisters and then there was some you know, question, we didn't want drama, but we felt it necessary that we invite uh, Paul Allen as well. And it turned out that uh, the one sister who had put fairly close brought him down. It was a great weekend at the service for reconciliation and uh, um, it was very heartwarming. And they, we went down, had dinner together. We, we got together at the house and celebrated several times. Um, yeah, again, they're just, the fact that they had uh, forgiven each other. You know, it's, I love Amen. the quote, you know, I've been forgiven of everything. Lord, help me forgive. It's, we've been forgiven of all of our sins. It's hard to believe that sometimes we hold back forgiveness, but uh, it, was, it was given. And I say all that to say because Three weeks later, he uh, was going to his church at 6.30 in the morning to flip pancakes for a dinner, or a breakfast, rather, and uh, it was hit, hit, and he died from complications of that about a week later. So that, that redemption and, uh, was, uh, was certainly important, and it was all because of grace. So that's uh, the name of the song. Feel, feel free to sing along. soiled and tattered His face was etched with pain But he wore a smile that lit the room So I asked him to explain He 
said I made some awful choices, wasted years, pierced many hearts, but the great physician healed my soul, and he gave me a brand new stone. It's all because of grace, son, where we are It's all because of grace, my heart and mind are free. I shall sin and stain, I'll never be the same because of God's great grace. It's all because of grace, I hope for every day. It's all because of grace. songs that you've written, and I haven't probably ever heard them all because you had several with the Islander Quartet that uh, 
he wrote. That's my favorite, as you might imagine. <laughs> the man I have most admired in my lifetime other than my father was a guy named Billy, Dr. Billy Graham spent a lifetime proclaiming a central truth, that is, there is good news for the people of planet Earth. At the heart of the good news is Jesus Christ, his life, his resurrection, um, and uh, death and resurrection, and uh, that there is forgiveness for sin. Encapsulate that. He ministered to presidents, to heads of state around the world. He preached in most nations of the world. He served as the conscience of America and much of the world, it's hard to believe, it's hard to think as we get older about a younger generation that don't, probably don't know Billy Graham at all. But uh, what, a, what a life he lived, a great moral leader, an, an anointed evangelist, and yet he was more. He was a prophet. He preached forgiveness. He preached love, justice, wrath. A prophet that told forth and sometimes foretold. There's a difference. That is the work of a prophet. They remind us of truth. Uh, they remind us of God's standard. Gail, welcome back. I forgot to say that. It's been a while since you... <laughs> she had a little accident, some of you may remember, and a big accident, actually. Well, I'm glad you're back. Um, people like to avoid prophets, a lot of people anyway, but we need a prophet. Now, there are no prophets emerging in the 21st century that foretell. In my sheltered opinion, there might be one, and that's Jonathan Kahn. But you don't have to agree with me. You may have someone else that you believe in. I think most people are not able to tell us what's coming with the accuracy that Jonathan is able to. But if you're not a John Kahn man, that's okay. We'll just not worry about that. Habakkuk was a prophet. That's who we're going to talk about this morning. You read about Habakkuk a lot. You know a lot about him. Uh, most of us don't. He was a prophet. His book, Habakkuk, is only three chapters. It's, it's a quick read. It's not necessarily an easy read. You'll notice similarities between 600 B.C. and 2024 if you read Habakkuk. The book was probably written about 600 B.C. by the prophet. This was the time when the Jews were being threatened uh, by the Babylonians. Uh, they're about to invade Judah. They're going to occupy Jerusalem. They're going to burn it to the ground. They're going to destroy the temple. And they're going to relocate most of the people, the ones that don't die, from their homelands into slavery. Now that period in history is called the exile, and it lasted 70 years. Okay, Let's talk about prophets. Prophets hate sin. Prophets are men on fire for God. They often speak with enormous energy, with emotion, and with conviction. They go to great lengths to express either joy or horror at what they see. With a prophet, it isn't just academic. It isn't just the facts and the statistics. Even certain passages of Scripture, it's something they feel deep inside. It's something that burns inside. On the negative side, they see the awesomeness and the evilness of sin and evil and how it affects people and society. Uh, they offer warnings from God. Uh, as they speak, the people will, will, will listen and then they will say cynically, they'll kind of cynically walk away and say, silly prophet, he's unhinged. I, I mean, religion is a racket after all, and, and, and so it's a crutch. But whether 600 B.C. or college campuses in 2024, Isaiah responds this way, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Habakkuk 1 re begins, The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet received, listen to the prophet's pain. Now I want you to hear, I want you to hear the prophet's pain. I'm going to do something that I rarely do, and that is uh, I'm going to read, first of all, from from the message, which I know I rarely do, and I am going to read at least one chapter. But I think you'll discover if you try to read Habakkuk that this really helps, unless you've read it several times. The problem as God gave Habakkuk to see it. God, how long do I have to cry out for help before you listen? 
Why, where are you at, God? Where are you? How many times do I have to yell, help, murder, police, before you come to the rescue? Why do you force me to look at evil, stare trouble in the face day after day, anarchy and violence break out, quarrels and fights all over the place, law and order fall to pieces, justice is a joke. The wicked have the righteous hamstrung and stand justice on its head. Sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? God says, look, look around at the godless nations. Look long and hard. Brace yourself for shock. Something's about to take place, and you're going to find it hard to believe. I'm about to raise up Babylonians to punish you. Babylonians, fierce and ferocious, world-conquering Babylon, grabbing up nations right and left, a dreadful and terrible people making up its own rules as it goes. Their horses run like the wind, attack like bloodthirsty wolves, a stampede of galloping horses thunders out of nowhere. They descend like vultures, circling in on Karen. They're out to kill. Death is on their minds. They collect victims like squirrels gathering nuts. They mock kings, poke fun at generals, spit on forts, and leave them in the dust. They'll all be blown away by the wind, brazen in sin. They call strength their God. Why is God silent now? God, you're from eternity, aren't you? Holy God, we aren't going to die, are we? God, you chose Babylonians for your judgment work? Rock-solid God, you gave them the job of discipline. But you cannot be serious. You cannot condone evil. So why don't you do something about this? He's a little bit in God's face, isn't he? Why are you silent now? This outrage, evil men swallow up the righteous, and you stand around and watch. The righteous weren't so righteous, though, were they? Uh, Verse 14, you're treating men and women as so many fish in the ocean, swimming without direction, swimming but not getting anywhere. And then this evil Babylonian arrives and goes fishing. He pulls in a good catch. He catches his limit and fills his creel. A good day of fishing. He's happy. He praises his rod and reel, piles his fishing gear on an altar and worships it. It's made his day, and he's going to eat well tonight. Are you going to let this go on and on? Will you let this Babylonian fisherman fish like a weekend angler, killing people as, the, as if they're, they're nothing but fish? And then just one verse in, verse, uh, in chapter 2. What's God going to say to my questions? I'm braced for the worst. I'll climb to the lookout tower and scan the horizon. I'll wait to see what God says, how he will answer my complaint. Well, actually, what you, what you see there is a guy that's pretty brave because he's really in God's face, but he is a prophet. Here the prophet seems to be expressing anger, obviously, uh, toward God, to the world. I feel the same way about America, although I don't blame it on God. I blame it <laughs> on God's people and the people that are not of God. He sees violence, he sees tragedy, he sees self-indulgence and sin and corruption and iniquity and bribery, a generation that has rejected God. And the prophet watches as the enemy sweeps across the border, he witnesses death, destruction, and he says, where is God? Where in all the world is God? But the children of Israel are reaping what they sow. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Or... The chickens have come home to roost. In 1810, Robert Southey wrote a book entitled The Curse of Kihama. And on the title page, he introduced a new expression, brand new expression. The words, the chickens always come home to roost. For example, in the book of Exodus, we read of Pharaoh, the evil king, who commanded that baby Moses be put to death by drowning in the Nile. But God spared him. And God punished Pharaoh, and Pharaoh planned that Moses die by drowning, but it was Pharaoh that ultimately died by drowning. The chickens always come home to roost. Let's move to the book of Esther. We read that an evil man named Haman has a plan, and his plan is to build a gallows on which he will hang Mordecai, a holy man, a man chosen of God, and Haman's plan is to kill Mordecai, a Jew, and ultimately the entire community of Jews. But when the king discovers the Zevi's plan, the gallows prepared for Mordecai become the instrument of death for Haman. And the chickens always come home to roost. 
Well, let's move on to Daniel, a holy man. In chapter 6 of Daniel, a plot was laid by the governors and the princes to find a way to have Daniel out of the way. We want him put to death. We don't like him. They're jealous. He by far was the wisest and the smartest of the king's advisors. These governors and princes brought a proclamation to the king. Sir, we have such high esteem for you, Mr. King. We love you. You are such a special kind of guy. Um, we, we, have, we want to put in place a decree that for 30 days, no person whatsoever will ask a petition of any god except you. You're a god, king. Not ask any, 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 not pray to, in other words. And the king was, he's kind of humble, you know, a little ego and honored. And, and, and in good faith, the king imprinted the royal seal from his ring onto the decree document, and the decree could not be changed once it was imprinted. Daniel, as the rulers of the provinces knew, Daniel prayed a lot, like three times a day, publicly. When Daniel was informed of the decree, what did he do? Well, he began the 30 days of silent prayer, right? Oh, no. Daniel went to his room and he opened his window to Jerusalem, toward Jerusalem and he got on his knees and he probably prayed a little extra loud that day and he was taken to the lion's den where he would most likely be the evening meal and the king spent the night worrying. Couldn't do anything about it, but he worried about Daniel. They were actually very close. He worried about his top advisor and arriving early in the morning, he shouted, Oh, Daniel, oh, Daniel, has your God delivered you? And the response from the darkness of the den was, O king, live forever. The God I serve has delivered me. The king, knowing he had been manipulated, had Daniel removed from the lion's den. And the men who planned death by lions for Daniel were placed in the den prepared for Daniel. Chickens always come home to roost. I could give you an example of the life and death of King Ahab and Jezebel. But I won't. Prophets are passionate as they see evil. They're passionate. And they see God is keeping his promises. And sometimes we don't like the way God is keeping his promises. Sometimes we get angry. One of the evidences that we're becoming biblical people or prophets in spirit is we get angry, we are incensed when we turn on the news or when we look at our phone and we see certain things. Uh, we see corruption, we see violence, we see uh, things at work that bother us in Washington and our nation and our world. In 2023, in the United States of America, 1,037,000 helpless, defenseless, unborn babies were murdered in the womb, mostly for convenience. The spirit of the prophet in you is probably angry, if you think about it. The leading producer of online pornography in the United States, almost 25%. We are leading by far. United Kingdom is next, but way down the list. That's this country, the leading producer of pornography. We're supposed to be the Christian nation. The state that produced the most pornography, of course, was California. You might have guessed that. Destroying people and families and the fabric, very fabric of society. That makes the prophet angry. The prophet and, and, and Christians cannot look at the nation, cannot look at the world and feel good about some of the things they see. In fact, biblical people have a responsibility to be angry at the things that make God angry. The prophet hates sin. I don't know if I ever said number one, but this is number two. <laughs> Prophets see with the eyes of God. Prophets are not only angry at sin, but they diagnose things. Most of us look on the surface, our culture, uh, you know, uh, thinks in terms of beauty and size and, and, tr and tangible things, uh, tangible worth. Prophets tend to look beneath the surface into the foundation, into the root cause. Uh, they take a long view. They look into the past and, and they look at history and, and they ask what has been the pattern of God's blessing and judgment and what have the prophets shown us and how has prophecy worked. And then they look at the present and they say this is what's happening right now. This is what it all means in light of the past and the present. This will be the long view. This is where we're headed. I think most of us are concerned about where we're headed. The genuine prophet, of course, is being guided by the Holy Spirit. Habakkuk diagnoses what he sees in chapter 2, and he begins, I will, I will, well, actually, I read that, I will start at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he, God, will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. So prophets, of course, were just, described as watchtower men, 
and uh, we see ramparts as kind of a metaphor. Either the people have come with questions, or the prophet is being prompted by God, or both, when we read these words. He, called up on, he is called upon to explain the times, and God says, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. Verse 3, for the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it, it will certainly come and it will not delay. So, let me suggest to you what is being said here. God, God's work through history is long term. I mean, a thousand years as a day, a day as a thousand years to the Lord. And prophets have to learn to wait. And so do the rest of us. And we don't like to wait. Biblical people learn to wait. And we're waiting. We've waited. It seems like for us a long time for the return of Christ who promised this so many years ago. But it doesn't matter that we get impatient. It doesn't matter that all of the data, including Chicken Little, says the sky is falling, the sky is falling. The prophet waits on the word of God. So with spirit-filled eyes, Habakkuk looks at the present, at the people of his generation, and this is what he says, speaking of God's people. Verse 4, he's puffed up. His desires are not upright. Indeed, wine betrays him. He's arrogant. He's never at rest because he's greedy as the grave, and like death, he's never satisfied. Uh, um, I guess I'll stop with that. What, what, what word would immediately jump out at you when you hear that? Probably, I would say, arrogance. These people think they're in control. They think they are responsible for their prosperity. We do, don't we? We think we're, we're responsible for our prosperity. They think they can solve their own problems. And Habakkuk looks at this generation and he says, you are knee-deep in arrogance. You are self-centered. You are self-righteous. And in verse 6 begins a series of passages which begin with the word woe, which we covered pretty well in Rob's Bible study. Uh, woe to him who piles up. By the way, woe means uh, doom. It's not Fonzie woe. Woe, it's woe that means doom, and it, it means grief, and it means trouble and distress. Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. Woe to him who builds his realm by unjust gain. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by crime. I think it might be talking there a little bit about uh, some politicians and some other folks that, uh, uh, you know, some of our big companies that... Uh, well, I think they fit some of these, maybe some little companies too. <laughs> Woe to him who says to wood, come to life, or to a lifeless stone, wake up. Can these things give guidance? That's talking about idols. What the prophet has done is, to, is, is doing here is to diagnose the times. And you may, be, you may want to ask, well, what does Habakkuk know about the problems that we have in the 21st century? Well, there are some problems that are uniquely 21st century. I know that, but we look below the surface and we discover that nothing really has changed. We have the same fundamental foundational problems, morally, spiritually, ethically. I know I'm preaching to the choir. Uh, I understand that. You, you, you know almost everything that I'm saying in one way or another. But in verse 4, the key word is arrogance. We're actually doing a little quick Bible study here. Uh, verse 6 speaks of criminal activity. Verse 9, extortion. Verse 18, the key word is idolatry. And uh, we have a lot of idols. They're just not made of wood, but there's a lot of other idols that we have. In the midst of crisis, I can still be faithful. Or I can cut and run. Doubt God, sin. If all the world is in rebellion, you can still be a person of faith. Back in chapter 2, verse 4, there is that paragraph on arrogance. See, he is puffed up. His desires are not upright. The message says, look at that man bloated by self-importance. And then it goes on to say, but the righteous will live by faith. The Apostle Paul quotes that phrase three times. The righteous, the biblical person, will let his faith be the factor that will govern his life. Everything else, you know, everything. Looks like the, the bad guys are winning always. And most of us, you know, when God says, I, I will repay, we kind of like to see that vengeance right away. We don't get to see it sometimes, but God will respond to those things that sometimes hurt us. And uh, we think, well, I'd sure like to get even, but I can't. Or I don't think God would be pleased if I did, but he said he would. <laughs> 
the prophet says, well, anyway, it looks like the Looked like the bad guys were winning, and the prophet says that that's how it looks. Babylonians are beginning to mount uh, an invasion, and the people have lost their moral compass, and the place is going up uh, in smoke. In other words, the chickens always come home to roost. So chapter 1, why evil and violence? Chapter 2, he waits for answers from, from God. And then chapter 3, which I'm not going to spend too much time on, but the prophet's prayer. Verses 1 and 2 is about revival. In verse 3, the prophet is remembering in his prayer, his glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. In his prayer, he simply remembered better days and prays for that return. We sang a song in one of our churches. I've never been able to find it again. It's so moving. In fact, I sang it with a young lady as a duet, and it was in a cantata. And it was about the children of Israel that were in a foreign land, and they had to hang up their harps or, I forget, some kind of instruments on the willows because uh, that's what they wanted to do, but the, the people who had uh, invaded their land and taken them wanted to hear the music. They didn't want to do the music. It reminded them of those days at home and, and how that they felt and how we respond to that. And that was sort of happening right here. In, in chapter 316, I, re, I hear and my heart pounded, my lips quivered at the sound, decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. What's that about? That's his response to the presence of the holy. Sometimes you think you'd like to see an angel or God. Well, sometimes we hear of angels and people, and I think I actually helped an angel one time. I really do. Uh, as he walked away, I thought, I wonder if that guy could be an angel. Because I'd helped so many people that were not angels. <laughs> anyway, that wasn't the reason. But, uh, and so, but there are times in the Bible where we see being in the presence of the holy causes you to just almost collapse in humility and uh, fright. I hear and my heart pounded and my lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. He recognizes in that his own imperfection. Uh, his heart is breaking as he sees his people so immoral and so imperfect. He knows calamity is coming. His people, uh, judgment is at hand. The chickens always come home to roost. But he also knows that God will forgive and will restore. And he did. That's the part we have to remember. Habakkuk reaches the climax of the book in verse 19 when he says, the sovereign Lord is my strength. The key word is sovereign. It's a, it's a theological word that speaks of God who has all power and all knowledge, can do all things in his own time, and he will do what he will do. We need to understand that the sovereign Lord is my strength, even when I feel weak, and I do. Continuing in verse 19, he makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go to the heights. I love to watch the goats and the deer and the, the animals that can get on a mountainside where there's no place to stand, and there they stand. It's incredible. I don't know how they do it. Got to be one in a, in a thousand that fall, but anyway, <laughs> watch that. It is so incredible. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go to the heights. In other words, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So, how's your faith? No matter what, what curve is thrown at you. Faith, you know, faith is not clinging. I like the illustration. Faith is letting go. There's a guy traveling on foot at night alone in an unpopulated area. And he's mugged. He's robbed by thieves. It's pitch dark. They steal his valuables. And then they tie a rope to a tree limb. And they carry the victim to the tree. And they kind of let him go. And he sort of swings there. And they have him to grasp the rope. And uh, he swings there like a pendulum out uh, to where the top of the rope is. They leave him there with these words. Don't let go. You're hanging over a cliff. You let go, you die. They make their escape. The man's terrified. The man's afraid. He felt doomed. 
It's like the end of my world. And he clutched the rope as it swayed back and forth. And every moment made his fate a little bit more certain and his strength steadily, steadily failing. His arms begin to burn with pain and slowly the rope begins to slip between his fingers and he knew it was just about over. And he fell, finally fell, about 12 inches to solid ground. That was just a ruse so the thieves could gain a little time to escape. But when he let go, it wasn't to death, and it wasn't to all the things that he had worried about, and it wasn't to all the things that caused him anxiety and fear. He fell to the safe place that was there all the time. So clutching will not save you from the hopelessness that you feel. The last thing God wants for me and you is to be like Habakkuk in those early chapters, consumed with worry and fear and anxiety and hopelessness, consumed with this difficult situation that we all face, anxious about an uncertain future, about what might happen. I know we all do that, don't we? We have to, we have to work on that. Um, you see, Satan wants you to hold on to the rope in fear and struggle and worry and anxiety. No matter what happens around you, you have to live with the heart and the hope of the prophet. Well, you don't have to, but I would recommend it. Satan wants you to hold on to the rope in fear and struggle and worry, uh, have ulcers, get a little, you know, work on your blood pressure, get it up a little bit. It is God's plan that the fall that you, it, is God, it is God's plan that you fall, once you understand that, but not to defeat, but rather into his arms that are always there. Always there, the solid rock. It's kind of a, one of the songs I thought about singing today, the solid rock. When the prophet began to see God's plan, he was reminded that the chickens always come home to roost. He also understood that there would be a new day for God's kids, and a new day for every believer. God is still on the throne, and I think we need to be reminded and encouraged, even when we pick on a book like Habakkuk, and you may want to go and read that. Uh, you could probably read it in the message, or you could read it six times in the King James, and maybe you should do both. But uh, a new day for every believer, because he's still on the throne, God is still God, and the whole earth, the whole earth is filled with his glory. Let's pray together. God is our refuge and our strength. God is the very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. My humble prayer today, O oh God, is that you help every person present as we struggle with fears anxieties, some things that wouldn't bother someone might terrify someone else. It's a very personal thing. We do not want to allow the negative to rule our lives. In obedience to you, may we soar as if on eagle's wings. Let us rise to the heights. Increase our vision. Increase our faith. Increase our hope. And thank you so for grace, amazing grace, and for your loving kindness. Minister to the needs that are here. Encourage those who need to be encouraged. Bless those who require a blessing. You know what we need, sometimes better than we know what we need. In Christ's name, amen. Stand with me, please. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you, and may God give to you his peace until you come to stand before Jesus in that day in which there is no sunset and no dawning. Amen.